Fantastic. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll get cracking uh, since we've uh, got 10 minutes to work with here. Uh, CABI, as you've just heard, is the Center for Advanced Bioenergy and Bioproducts Innovation. And I'm very happy to be here uh, talking on behalf of our team. I uh, want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Oh, too far. OK, so uh, the, we're funded by the Department of Energy. Um, we're in the uh, sixth year of 10 years of funding uh, to date, and DOE is giving us money to try to make the scientific discoveries and develop the technical innovations necessary for a domestic bioeconomy to be both profitable um, and to realize significant environmental benefits. Um, obviously, society uh, will gain a lot uh, from us achieving that complicated and complex goal. Um, in terms of counteracting climate change, uh, providing a domestic source of energy, uh, developing a more diverse and resilient agricultural system, um, as well as uh, significant rural economic development. So I want to tell you a little bit about how we're trying to get there. Uh, the center is organized around three research themes, which you can see on this slide in different colors. Uh, the sustainability theme, the feedstock production theme, and the conversion theme. Uh, feedstock production focuses on developing next generation uh, feedstock crops, uh, in particular miscanthus, sorghum, and sugarcane. Um, they're all uh, closely related, highly productive, highly resilient uh, crops right now, um, but they've received a lot less uh, attention in terms of research and development than our um, commodity crops, so we think there's a lot of room to improve them further. Uh, we're particularly trying to increase the value of the biomass that they produce um, by enriching them with high levels of vegetative lipids. Um, that's a very, very dense, energy dense uh, molecule um, that can be turned into a lot of high value uh, products. In addition to engineering in that um, oil production, uh, we're also looking to make the crops as highly productive, resilient, and sustainable um, as possible. So with some relatively simple bioprocessing, um, which we test at um, IBRL, which I think you've heard about already. Um, we think we can produce a, a drop-in biodiesel um, and something that can be easily upgraded into a sustainable aviation fuel. Um, we think about 20% of the above-ground biomass of the crop could be in those oils. Uh, that leaves another 80% um, in lignocellulose, um, which can be deconstructed into sugars. And when we can it, then take those plant-derived sugars and lipids that are being produced by the feedstocks and pass them to our conversion theme. Uh, they're using a variety of pioneering synthetic biology and automation techniques uh, to engineer yeast that will then ferment those plant-derived oils and sugars into a wide variety of high-value platform uh, chemicals. Um, and then lastly, we have the sustainability theme, which are keeping checks and balances on everybody else um, they're the ones doing uh, the ecosystem greenhouse gas um, evaluations, uh, doing the techno-economic analysis and the life cycle analysis. And so through that process and through interactions amongst all of those themes, uh, we think we're going to be able to um, help our region produce uh, sustainable aviation fuels, uh, biodiesel, and then a range of products that would include uh, surfactants, detergents, paints, plastics, uh, food preservatives, um, and more. Um, so that the sustainability theme has already collected a globally unique data set on the greenhouse gas balance of, of these crops in the field. And so I just want to highlight um, miscanthus here in particular. So we've, we've got great data um, that miscanthus is the, the best option we can find in terms of actually having an in-field uh, carbon sink, the significant amounts of carbon going um, out of the atmosphere and into the soil. And that's despite the fact that it has received less R&D attention than other crops to date. Um, but a, a key component of what our feedstocks theme is doing is providing platform tools that can then uh, allow us to throw um, all of the tools of modern crop improvement at making it even better. And so this includes the fact that they've generated uh, haplotype resolved genome sequence, and they've published the first example of being able to do gene editing in these crops. Um, they've gathered together uh, a globally unique uh, germplasm collection. Um, and we've developed a variety of AI-enabled phenotyping tools um, which allow us to improve that germplasm pool uh, through breeding. Uh, so we're really at a point now where we think we can accelerate very quickly um, to improve these crops. Just to give you a flavor of what the conversion theme is doing, um, they're taking, as I said, those plant-derived 
chemicals and upgrading them. And so this is one example from a paper they published last year where they're ta starting with plant-derived sugars and the graph in the middle is showing you a fermentation run that was performed at the Integrated Bioprocessing Research Lab on campus. You can see the picture on the left. And the red line is showing you the production of uh, succinic acid, um, which is a high value um, food preservative. I can tell you that they're doing that with less greenhouse gas emissions than the existing market technologies. And on the right hand side, you can see a graph showing that they're doing it while making that product more cheaply. So this is what we're all about. Can we make it for you for less money and can we make it for you more cheaply? And we have a variety of products like this um, coming out of the, the CAPI pipeline. Um, one element that I'm keen to highlight while I'm here uh, with you on the research park is just through that wall, if you could see through it, um, you would be able to see this um, construction project. Um, so with generous support from a variety of units um, on campus, we're in the process of building this high throughput phenotyping greenhouse. Um, we also particularly um, appreciate the partnership we've had with the University of Real Estate Services, the Research Park and Fox Development Corporation. Uh, we just broke ground last September um, and we're looking to have this facility open and running um, this summer. Um, when you're able to walk inside it next year, if you want to come and visit, you'll see two main uh, capabilities. Uh, one is uh, real-time and automatic phenotyping in order to be able to monitor plant growth uh, and water use. And so a key target for us is to uh, make these crops grow with less water demand so they can be uh, produced in uh, marginal lands um, and not have to compete with our, our major uh, food and commodity crops. Um, and then the second component is going to be a, a controlled growth chamber facility um, into which we're going to put special tracer gas technologies that let us study uh, the exchange of carbon and nutrients between plants, soil, and their associated microbes. Um, if we look just slightly broader than CABI, um, I want to emphasize something that we had, a, we had a kickoff meeting last week for a bioeconomy innovation hub. So CABI is a basic science center. Our job is um, to do foundational um, research. Um, and so that means we focus in those first four technical readiness levels you see on this uh, diagram. But we do ultimately want to see um, the, the discoveries we make translate um, to the market and have societal benefit. Um, and we're concerned about the valley of death <laughs> that you see in the middle. And so we're in the middle of uh, assembling a group of partner companies and, and want to encourage interactions with, with others um, in order to address this. Um, we can give you some small scale examples already. So this is a, a DOE funded project where we're partnering with Alder Energy and a variety um, of their industry partners. Um, CABI is contributing uh, the feedstock in the form of Miscanthus on the left hand side here as well as the expertise in greenhouse gas monitoring and, and life cycle analysis. Um, passing that to these um, partner companies with the end result that uh, sustainable aviation fuels are being made. We want to be able to expand our capabilities to build these sorts of relationships. Um, and so this is the, the path we have just set off on, um, where at the moment, in 2024, we're on the left-hand side here, we're just uh, doing feasibility, social, uh, feasibility studies, trying to build community uh, around this idea and, and uh, producing prototyping facilities. Um, we want the, uh, to use the university to uh, lead demonstration uh, projects um, on growing these crops and uh, making products from them locally. But within 10 years, we want to have enough of this that it, it becomes an industry-led um, exercise. And so this involves uh, de-risking the whole process in terms of um, building Muscanthus acreage, uh, del delivering those feedstocks, um, ensuring that there are the suitable markets available, um, and doing the sustainability verifications that are necessary. Um, and so this is some of our key partners who were here last week, uh, our Agrotech, Genera, um, and Drax. Um, but we, if, if you're interested in this space and want to talk about it, we'd love to um, inc increase this list <laughs> um, of companies and partners um, as we move forward. Um, and I'll just leave you by saying that workforce development is a really key part of our mission as well. Um, we're delighted to be putting out a press release very soon that um, Boeing is going to be our fa founding sp sponsor for our RISE internship program. Um, and so this is an undergraduate program that draws students from across the nation 
um, to do research in CABI labs um, on the Illinois campus, um, plus on the 20 other institutions around the country that are part of CABI. Um, uh, it's targeting underrepresented uh, students, um, and we really want to make that a, an opportunity for them to learn, uh, and also a rec recruitment opportunity uh, for those of you out there in industry. So if you have interest in that, uh, please get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. This is the lightning round. I promised Desiree I'd keep this to no more than 30 minutes. Um, I gave you an eye chart to read. You don't really have to look at that. I feel really want up. Andrew didn't tell me ahead of time he was going to have a video embedded in his PowerPoint. So I'm already feeling pretty inferior here. So my name is Dennis Beard. And uh, as Catherine said, I'm with uh, Sarah Ventures. Uh, headquartered uh, here in Champaign, Illinois. A little bit about Sarah. Uh, uh, Sarah was originally a consultancy started by Tim Hare, who's taking a picture of me right now, uh, back in 2008, 2009, somewhere around there. And I joined him shortly, shortly after. And we were working with uh, mostly academics, professors, grad students, postdocs, students, undergrads, um, anybody affiliated with the university to try to commercialize their technology and turn it into a business. And everybody, of course, could use a little business advice. Tim and I are both reformed accountants. But what they really wanted was money. And uh, so we were kind of like, I have a little bit of money. I have a little bit of money. We know some people with some money. And we were helping these companies raise money. And we decided there's got to be an easier way to do this. And we finally figured out that we should form a fund, a venture fund. And if you know anything about venture funds, they're just organized, limited partnerships where a bunch of people and institutions put their money together with a common goal of finding certain types of companies to invest in. And uh, that's what we've been doing since 2010 when we launched the first, the first fund. I should mention we have a few, a few of the team members here. Tim, Tim here, is here, Tim Hare, and Karen O'Connor. And uh, see, I've got Bavesh over here. Chandra Sager is here. Uh, Drew Beard was here, uh, uh, very related. And um, let's see, Bruce Sommer was here, and uh, Bob Easter has been helping us out. I saw Bob a few minutes ago. There's Bob back by the door. Anyway, we're well represented here today. As I mentioned, we started right here in the research park, in fact, and uh, recently moved downtown. But uh, 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 what Andrew's presentation uh, reminded me of, of why we're here, we, wanted, we like sticking close to where the innovation is happening at the really early stage. Originally, we were very broadly focused into different technologies, so we did a lot of things coming out of computer science and engineering, and, and we did some stuff in ag, and we did uh, some healthcare-related uh, technologies. And um, the light bulb went on about four years ago that maybe with the next fund that we do, we should focus on food and ag. We realized we'd had a, a group of about 10 companies in the ag space that we'd invested in that had done um, pretty well. And um, I, I, I saw a presentation in our, in our uh, uh, ag tech breakfast that talk about this being a, a key eco center for ag technologies and agriculture in general. And we thought this is as good a place as any to jump in and try to be a leader uh, here in Illinois and in the Midwest in investor investing in ag technologies. Um, so a little bit about what, you, what we do. Uh, uh, some of you have, have, have met us and know a little bit about what we do, but if you don't know anything about how venture capital works, um, sometimes it gets a little bit of a bad name. Sometimes I like to just say, hey, we match funds with, with entrepreneurs. That's, we, we play the middle person. We try to find money, we try to match it up with entrepreneurs. Um, it's kind of like what uh, Bruno Jactel said earlier, it's, it's simple, but it's very difficult. So if you break it down into kind of four steps, uh, we raise investment dollars. So we form these entities and we ask investors to participate. We have to put our own money into that. You wouldn't put your money in if you didn't see me putting my money in too. So we, we put a pretty significant amount of our own uh, personal money into it. So we raise these dollars and then we start looking for uh, interesting uh, companies to invest in. And we invest uh, toward the early stage. We used to do super early stage. And um, now we've, uh, as we've gotten the funds a little bit bigger, it makes more sense to invest. Usually when companies have revenues, they have proven that they have customers that we can call and talk to. We're gonna pay more to get in, into uh, shares, owning shares in a company that's a little further along. Uh, but to us, it's a little bit wor it's worth it. And uh, um, it, it makes a lot of sense. Although we, you know, we've been known to step out of that box from time to time. 
So we raise dollars, we seek investment opportunities. Once we make an investment in a company, we try to help those companies grow. And sometimes it's as simple as helping them make some connections to other people that we might know. Sometimes it's rolling up our sleeves, sitting on the board, um, giving them business advice. And if we know anything about scaling the business up, uh, business development, uh, financial controls, anything along that line, uh, we can help with those kinds of things. Um, sometimes we don't pick a company because we just simply think we can't really help them. They're, they're not what we do. Could be a great company, but we're, we're not going to add some value. So we try to partner up with people that we can bring some help to. And once they start growing, we try to get them, help them get to a critical mass. And, and we're going to invest with people that have a goal of eventually selling out to a bigger company or um, maybe going public, uh, but, but finding what we call an exit, which is a chance for, for the folks that started the business to cash in alongside their investors. And uh, one thing we've been able to do in our ag companies, along with some others, is have some nice exits. Uh, just to drop a couple of names, uh, one of our early investments in the ag space was a company called 640 Labs, which sold to the Climate Corp at Monsanto. Many of you are familiar with Agrable, which started right here in the research park, and we were able to uh, help them uh, sell to Nutrien. Uh, we also helped a company here in Illinois called Label Insight, which sold to Nielsen IQ. And we've got more companies uh, in the portfolios right now that we're helping that aren't there yet, but hopefully they will be. Uh, uh, Hazel Technologies up in Chicago and Camo Ag, uh, these are all Illinois companies. Uh, the, uh, the, the Kuman Club and, and even though uh, Hypercell started in Georgia, it's an Illinois company, so we'll put them on the list as well. And uh, all these things kind of converged in these funds have a limited life and we usually have what we call an investment period, which is three or four five years maybe, and we try to identify the companies we're going to invest in that first three or four years. And once we're to that point, we aren't looking for any more companies to add, but we do hold back capital to help those companies keep growing. It's a combination of you know, money and talent and technology and, and luck and all kinds of things going on. So we always assume they're going to need more money. By the way, we tend to invest in syndicates. We don't do these by ourselves. So we like other investors to join us. Uh, especially uh, investors with special uh, experience or contacts in the particular industry of the company. You want to build a, a syndicate of people sitting around the table that can all help and when times get hard, and times will get hard. The entrepreneurs in the room know that you don't start a company and, and not have really difficult times along the way, and we try to be ready and help those companies be ready. Um, so anyway, a couple more things about uh, Sarah. Um, uh, we've done over 50 ag and food investments. If you include our support of the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator, Jack Mark, I saw Jack around here earlier. I don't know where Jack is sitting right now, if he's in the room at the moment. But the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator, which is uh, something the community pulled together, and we provided uh, the biggest chunk of the financing, but we aren't alone in that. And we've had a ton of help from people here in the Research Park community and EDC and uh, some other uh, interested investor and corporate types. And uh, they're bringing uh, 10 companies a year through the accelerator that are early stage and coaching them and mentoring them and helping overcome whatever hurdles they're at. And in some of those companies, we get a piece of the equity in those in exchange for money that goes into those companies. So any, anyway, long story short, we've done over 50 ag and food tech investments between our previous funds, our most recent ag tech fund, and the accelerator. And the numbers are looking pretty good. We, we seem to be seem to be experienced a pretty good success rate. The companies are growing pretty well. We've had some nice exits, and we've got other companies that are very promising, a very low failure rate, and uh, so we're really excited. Uh, in fact, last year, uh, PitchBook rated us the third most active investor in ag and food tech, which is pretty amazing to us. I mean, a, a small, small fund family based in Champaign it, to, to make number three in the country on that was a pretty proud moment for us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alan. So um, what you see on the screen there is, is uh, Sarah Grondex, and I'll give you just a little tidbit of background on that and what that name means. Uh, it was mentioned by our mayors this morning, which was pretty cool, uh, i got to say. Um, uh, a while back, as we were starting to conceptualize this fund and work on it, uh, um, a, a group from the Netherlands uh, called Grondex uh, reached out to us to see what we're doing. And uh, Grandex is two principals in Wageningen, which if you know the, the university there, it's a leading agriculture school in Europe. And the head of this firm had nine years as an ag econ professor here at University of Illinois. 
and was introduced us, to us by one of our investors, and we did some asking around, and it turns out we have lots of mutual colleagues and lots of um, uh, mutual friends, and um, we found out what they're doing is they have formed a $400 million land investment fund backed by institutional investors, and they're buying land uh, primarily in the UK and Europe, and they're focusing on using that land in sustainable ways, particularly focusing on regenerative farming, farming techniques. And they realize it's, it's tough. It's really hard to do things the right way and make a good profit. And they realize that technology is a key part of making that land ownership successful. So they wanted to be able to tap into new technologies in that area. And one of our investors suggested they contact us. And, and uh, uh, Tim and I and, and Rob had multiple, have had multiple conversations with uh, these two gentlemen. And um, we found out we're pretty much on the same page. Uh, what they found out, though, is they really aren't ready to be a venture capital fund. They're a land investment fund. We're not land investors. We're technology investors. So we decided to, to work together on this new fund. We're still going to be the primary partnership that drives this fund. But we're going to tap into Grandex's land ownership. We're going to use them to help us evaluate technologies, both in the U.S. and in Europe and elsewhere. And, um, and, and they may even end up helping us raise a little bit of money as we go. Um, but uh, it's a pretty exciting uh, moment to, uh, to work with the Grandex folks over in the Netherlands. Um, so if you look here, um, what, what the slide says, the eye chart, I apologize that. We're, we're focusing on, uh, we think the time is right. We, we just finished up investing in this first new fund, and uh, one of our large institutional investors said, uh, you need to keep it going. You're, you're serving in an underserved market. Uh, there are a lot of investors that would like to be investing in this space. Uh, why don't you just launch another fund that keeps doing the same thing? And, and it's essentially the same thing. We're going to do uh, maybe a couple things a little bit differently, uh, but we're going to carry on. But, but our point is um, there are some good reasons to keep investing. We've got uh, changing consumer. You know, the millennials are kind of driving this market in a big way. Not, they're not the only ones, and they're convincing a lot of the rest of us to pay attention to what they're thinking. But they want transparency. They want healthier food. They want safe food. And they want food that's uh, good for the environment. Uh, the farmers are changing, and others in the value chain. And uh, then finally, we've got uh, climate concerns. It's, uh, it's a healthy climate that we're all trying to contribute to. So we think by investing in, in uh, the right technologies right now, we can build a, uh, another successful fund and keep it going right here in Champaign and in the Midwest. So that's my lightning round. My time's up. Thanks, everybody.